Hello everybody and welcome to this, my first of one video on the Canon, Canonet QL17 uh, G3, uh, Canon Canonet G3 QL17. That's what it's named. Just have to go back and forth a bunch. This is a 35 millimeter rangefinder camera. What that means is it uses any 35 millimeter film you would like to put in it with limitations on speed. I would not go much above 200 ISO in this camera for reasons we'll get into. It is a rangefinder in that you look through the viewfinder in the back here, and as you adjust the focus, the camera will tell you in the viewfinder how accurate your focus is. By, that's why it's called a rangefinder. It adds a range finding mechanism to the viewfinder. It has a mercury-powered scene meter, meaning that it uses old mercury-powered batteries. Shutter speeds of 1 quarter to 1 500th and bulb. It has a focusing screen in the rangefinder with parallax correction and 0.6x magnification, meaning that what you see in here is about 60% the size of what's going to end up on the film. And then the flash sync on this camera is any speed because it has a leaf shutter. The Canon Canonet G3 QL17 was targeted at, targeted at mid to high end rangefinder users. It has a good and fast lens, a light meter, solid build quality, shutter priority shooting with a working light meter, which this camera doesn't have, or aperture priority. Is it aperture? Automatic? No, it is, it is shutter priority. Okay. Anyway, this camera does not have a working light meter, so it will uh, only shoot in full manual mode. The light meter sensor is on the lens, so filters will be accounted for in metering. It's upgraded from the previous model, the new Canonet, by adding a battery check button on the back right there. And it can also be used in full manual mode without a battery, meaning that this rangefinder is not toast if the meter on it fails. It was made by Canon in Taiwan from 1972 to 1982, and around 1.2 million of these were sold, so they're a fairly common high-end rangefinder. It was preceded by the new Canonet, concurrent with many, many Canon cameras, specifically the entire F and A series cameras, the G319 and the A35F, as well as a boatload of point and shoots. And followed by, insofar as I can tell, nothing. There was no G4. I don't know that Canon continued making rangefinders after 1982, or if they did, they were unrecognizable to something that would follow this. So let's go over what's on the camera as we do. And we'll start here on technically the sides with the strap lugs where you connect your camera strap. Here we have the film rewind knob and lever. Canon at QL17, film plane indicator so that if you're doing except extremely detailed precision measurements, you have the film plane indicator there. Flash hot shoe, film advance and shutter arming lever, shutter release, frame count window. On the camera's front, Canon G3 quick load, rangefinder window, viewfinder window. Here's the lens. This is the focusing arm right here. On the lens itself, we have the light meter reading uh, diode. Then on top of it, we have this little index right here will tell you your focus point from infinity down to uh, 2.6 feet, which is 0.8 meters. Here we have the aperture ring, f16 to f1.7 in manual mode. This is stepless, there are no clicks in it. Automatic mode, meaning shutter priority. And these are your flash settings, whether you want to have, is that correct? I won't lie, uh, I don't, I did not write down what these three blue numbers are for, but I will tell you that when I try to use them, the camera jams, so I'm not going to. I suspect that these have to, are, require power to go to the camera to work functionally, uh, to work correctly in the same way that automatic mode does. 
Here we have the ASA viewing window so you know what your film speed is, your shutter speed selection, and this black line here on the top of the lens indicates what your aperture is set to as well as what your shutter speed is set to. Then this is the self timer lever which I'm not going to use. So then over here on this side is the ISO selection switch which is a little bit fiddly. What you have to do is push that in and then rotate that lever to select the ISO that you want. And generally speaking with rangefinder cameras because 1 500th is a slower shutter speed, you're going to want to limit yourself to something that's ISO 200 and slower. Because by the time you get to ISO 400, in the daylight, you're limited to 1 500th and F16. And while this camera can go up to ISO 800, at that point, you are not shooting in daylight. So if you're gonna use faster um, films with this camera, they're more going to be for evening and indoor use. On the camera's back, we have the battery check button here, and if the batteries were working, that little light above it would uh, light up, but the electronics in this camera are shot. Viewfinder window right here. Uh, Rangefinder window, I take that back. Film transport indicator, which indicates that film is moving in the uh, camera. And then also another backup indicator over here. And then the serial number down here, made in Taiwan. On the camera's bottom, we have the battery chamber right here, tripod socket, and film uh, rewind button. On the inside, we have the quick load system, which is very nice, great innovation. Film cassette chamber, film guide pins here, here, not here, and here. Guide rails are these four silver things, the one on the ones on the outside keep the film from moving up and down as it travels. The ones in the middle work with the film. Film pressure plate to keep the film flat on plane. Film take up sprocket, uh, tension sprocket, film take up spool. Quick load system here. These two rollers on the quick load system put tension right there when the film is loaded to keep it on the sprocket. Film pressure plate and film cassette spring to keep the, the spring Orient, uh, the film cassette oriented properly within the camera. And we'll see how all of this works with film in, later in the video. Before we get to that, however, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the battery. The battery chamber is right here. And a, an A76-357 type battery will work in it, but is the incorrect voltage. If you do have a Canonet QL17G3 with a working light meter, you can use modern batteries, but you're going to have to compensate for the voltage difference in them. The way to do that is to, let's say you take 200 ISO film and put it in the camera. You set your shutter speed to 1 250th, because that's the closest number to 200, and your aperture to f16. Now you're going to go outside on a sunny day, and with the sun to your back, you're going to take a meter reading with this camera. And then you're going to adjust the ISO setting until your meter reading is accurate. And that will allow you to compensate through the ISO setting for the voltage difference between the modern batteries and the old ones. Next thing we're going to do is load film. To get into the camera's film back, you just lift up on the, the film rewind knob and lever and open the back. We're going to grab our roll of film, drop it into the camera, and then put the post back in place and this will engage the film. We're going to pull out a little bit of a leader and that red index there tells us where to load the film to. And then we're going to try to get it in there like that. Close the door part way. This part now holds the film in place while we close the door the rest of the way. We're going to advance the film one frame. Make sure that there's no slack in it. And to do that you rewind until you feel tension. Then we're going to advance until we get to frame one, which is one more. There we go. Now, if your light meter works, what you need to do is adjust the ISO, the ASA, to your film's ISO. ISO and ASA numbers are the exact same. When ASA stopped 
taking charge of film standards and film speed ratings. ISO took over and then just took the ASA and the DIN numbers and used them as the standard. So 200 ASA is the exact same thing as 200 ISO. So just set your film speed to the correct uh, setting and you're ready to go. And all you're gonna do basically is go through your day taking the photos that you're taking with your camera and you know it's working if this here advances. If this spins, then the film is being taken up because there is a physical connection between the take-up spool pulling the film out of the cassette, which is connected to the rewind knob. Just like that. When you're done taking all of your photos, what you then need to do is rewind the film. Film can record an image exactly once. Well, film can record light exactly one time in a controlled manner through an accurate shutter speed and aperture, or in an uncontrolled manner by simply opening up the back of the camera like that and erasing all of your images. Now, I'm doing this to show you what it looks like when you take a picture. You activate the shutter and the film is pulled out of the cassette and taken up over here on the take up spool. When you're done with your film, you hold down the film rewind button and then you just start rewinding it. Do this all before you open the film back. That sound that you just heard is audible with the film back closed. And once you have heard that, then rewind a handful more times and then you can open up the film back and pull out your cassette. I'm leaving a leader because I have other videos to use this film with. So, after you take out your cassette, then you can put another one in if you want, or if you are done shooting for the day, close that up, trigger the shutter so that it rests and uh, you're good to go. Next thing we're gonna talk about is how to use a flash with this camera. There is a PC port, which I forgot to mention earlier in the video, over here on the side. Just have to move that cover and there's your flash PC port. There's also a hot shoe right here. The flash syncs at this speed on any shutter speed, even 1 500th. And the reason for that is because it has a leaf shutter. So the leaf shutter is closed right now. Let me uh, open up the aperture and you can see the shutter leaves. There you go. Should be able to see the leaves of the shutter in there. And if we take a picture, I'll show you what it looks like when the uh, shutter fires. And it doesn't matter what the shutter speed is. We'll, do, we'll try, try for 1 60th and see if that works with our camera's frame rate. Yeah, got a partial frame because um, 1 60th is faster than the camera's current frame rate, uh, the video camera's frame rate. So at any rate, um, what happens when you fire a leaf shutter is that the entire leaf shutter apparatus opens and then closes, and that's at any shutter speed. So the leaves always open at the same speed, the shutter speed is governed by how long until they close again. So that's why any speed will allow a flash sync because the, into all of the leaves have to open for it. So if you're going to use a flash on this camera, there are uh, some basic tips for using a flash are, this right here is the worst possible flash arrangement. Having the flash right on top of your lens sends the light out to your subject and back, making it look waxy, flat, and just generally unflattering. So if you're going to use the hot shoe, what you want to try to do is get a flash that articulates upward so you can bounce the light off of your ceiling. And that's because whenever we see something, whether it's a person or a tree or uh, just a camera sitting on a desk, it's lit from above. The sun is above us. Ceiling lights are above us. Street lights are above us. We are used to and geared mentally toward seeing things lit from above. So you wanna mimic that with your flash if possible. If you're outside, what you wanna do is get a flash that has a PC cable that you can plug into your PC cable and a flash bar like this, and then angle your flash this way so that it bounces off of a wall or something like that. Or even this way if you don't have a wall to bounce it off of because this is better than directly on top of your camera. 
So those are some lens, uh, some flash use basics to help you get started using a flash with this camera. Let's go through all of this and talk about how to take a picture with the camera. To focus, what you want to do is look through this viewfinder here and adjust the focus until everything is lined up and nicely in focus. There we go. And then you take your picture. In automatic mode, you just pick the shutter speed and then the camera will pick the best aperture. In full manual mode, you pick the shutter speed and the aperture. And uh, just kind of hope you're right. You can use the Sunny 16 rule uh, or the, the camera's light meter to give you an idea of what your actual settings should be. And then you just, again, focus and take your picture. It's really easy. The camera's designed to be very simple to use, and it, it is. And of course, it's paired with a very good lens, so it will take very nice photos as well. Some things not to do with your camera. Don't store your camera with the, cam lens, with the shutter ready to fire. Whenever you're done for the day, trigger the shutter. The reason is because this is a completely clockwork shutter. So whenever you wind it, it puts a bunch of springs under tension. And if they stay like that, they're gonna develop a memory and become weak, or they're gonna become fatigued and break. Either one is a problem for accurate shutter timing. So always disarm your shutter before letting it sit, and that will help ensure that you preserve your shutter uh, and it's for as long a lifespan as it can have. Don't leave your camera in your car. Heat can cause lubricating oils in it to get really thin and get onto the aperture, and that's not so much a big deal. If there's oil on the aperture blades on this camera because you're setting the aperture yourself and you're not looking through the lens, no big deal. If oil gets onto the leaf shutter leaves, that's a problem because that will affect your shutter timing. And that can happen if the oil gets really hot and then gets, gets very thin and gets into places it shouldn't before cooling down and getting back to the proper viscosity. Also, if it's really cold out and the oils in it get, get too cold, they will get thick and gummy and then they won't work. So um, don't leave it in your car. And also, even if you're just hopping into the, the convenience store to grab a, a drink or something like that, take your camera gear with you because it's a whole lot easier than replacing it and a car window if someone decides to break into your car and take your camera gear while you're not there. Don't leave your camera in a plastic bag or box because plastic is permeable and moisture will get into it, which can cause fungus to grow on your lenses and mildew and mustiness to get into your leather covering. And that is not a smell you want next to your nose. Don't let this get wet because that will, that is one of the things that kills light meters in these old range finders is water gets into the diode, and corrodes it, and then the, the light meter is shot. Um, but don't let it get wet because that can cause the internal components to rust in the shutter as well as inside the camera. It can also cause the electronics to stop working. And just remember that your Canon Canonet G3 QL17 is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of the camera, the camera will take care of you. <laughs> Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.